All right, good afternoon, actually morning still. Everybody welcome and aloha. My name is Jeff Bloom. I am chairman of the board of AFCEA Hawaii. And about a month ago, I had the privilege to go to Calder Springs for the Rocky Mountain Cyber Symposium. And at the time, while I was there, one of the briefings was by Colonel Chu, who goes by the name Styx. But he always told me it's like, it's CH, I owe you money. So I'm still waiting for him to pay me what he owes me from Colorado. But uh, anyways, we talked about the integrated warfighting networks and he asked if he could come to Hawaii and give a brief to some of our folks in this AOR about what the Air Force is doing. And again, I think if you were here for the J6 panel yesterday, you would have heard IWN was mentioned between some of our sixes talking about that and the ability of us to go into our warfighting as we just heard with our coalition partners in the last panel, but also even between our services and how we're sharing information even across services. So I think this is an important to hear. This is certainly coming down from the, uh, the Department of the Air Force. And again, the interesting thing about Styx is he's actually, he works for Microsoft and he's um, on leave from Microsoft, active duty now, temporary duty with the Air Force. So again, having an industry person wearing a uniform uh, is really a great, again, another way that industry and our government military can work together. And again, thank you for your service and taking the time. I'm not sure I would wanna leave Microsoft and go back to <laughs> Air Force, but, but he does live in Seattle. So anyways, with that, we only have 30 minutes. I'll turn it over to Styx. And again, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that uh, intro. And I would say, um, you know, when I walk through airports, wherever, and people say thank you for your service, really the privilege is mine. I have the privilege to be an immigrant to this country, great country, great republic, and serve in the way that I serve, which is phenomenal. Uh, so it's a, I count it a privilege to be where I am. So um, anyway, I have, we don't got th 30 minutes, so I'm going to blow through this. And afterwards, if you want to remain and ask questions, you're welcome. Uh, but I would ask that maybe hold your question until the very end. There's uh, a lot of content, and I do like to talk. So um, what is the IWN? I think, uh, and I, I, I see some uniform people out there also, so this is great. Um, but I want to paint a vision of what this is, because I think um, people think about integrated warfighting network, they think it's a thing, they think it's a product, but no, it's not a thing, you can't buy it, you can't say I wanna buy two IWNs or three, but it's a architectural framework as a concept uh, that we wanna use to inform our enterprise on how to build uh, networks going forward. And I don't mean just any network, it's a fabric, it's a ubiquitous black fabric in which we fight and through which we also fight and engage our adversaries. So. That's the uh, thing, and one of the key things that it gives us is the ability to be very, very agile in the way we move about. And you'll see why architecturally, why it really helps us to be able to achieve a very quick uh, movements in supporting our agile combat employment, as well as leading to the joint operational environment in JADC2. When I first came on active duty about a year and a half ago, uh, it's probably going to be a two or three year stint um, before I retire. But um, <clears throat> we were doing ABMS at the time. And they said that the ABMS intent and mission was to connect sensors to shooters. And my first question was, over what network are you expecting to do that? And so I set out on a mission, and I had a, my first one-on-one -on -one with uh, Mr. Dunlap, President Dunlap, the Chief Architect of the Air Force. I said, if I can do one thing before I leave your team, that would be to modernize the Air Force network. And, um, <clears throat> and so eventually, he and Lauren Knausenberger teamed up and said, hey, we need to modernize our classified networks. So born was IWN. Uh, we started our first uh, summit in uh, August of last year, and so it's only been eight months since then. Uh, so we moved extremely fast, and we're breaking all sorts of glass. And the reason we're breaking glass is because I'm a reservist. I don't know any better. I don't know that I can't do that, right? So, but they are giving me enough rope and giving me leadership support so that I can do what I'm doing and building a coalition of the willing, which is uh, great. And so we, have, we see a lot of partners here from PACAF, from uh, SAFCN, from USAFI. Uh, which started with our uh, architectural de uh, demonstration last year. Um, so in the end of it, 
what I tell the guys is that we're not building an IT network. We are building a cyberspace environment. That's what the fabric is. And I think we think of networks as independent from um, cyber environment, perhaps. But to me, this is a pure cyberspace environment that we move through, that we fight in, okay? So in the end of it, what we want to do is basically, if you imagine with me, we want to envelop the Earth with a co connective fabric. And that means space, air, sea, and land. So that when you're anywhere on Earth, you can get to any data that you need. You should be able to go to Shenzhen, China, sit in their cafes, over their Wi-Fi, and have the ability to access TSSEI data. You should. The technology is there now, not that you ever want to. And I see you shaking your head, Sheila, but uh, <laughs> not that you would ever want to, but we want to make it possible so you can do that. So you can be truly agile. We should be thinking about the network like we think about electricity. You, how often do you think about electricity? You don't. When you lose them, exactly. We should think about networking like that. What we do now, what we do in the morning is we come in the office, we power up a computer, we walk away for 15 minutes while it boots up, and then we go be, gab with our neighbors and then come back. The user experience is terrible, but it's not just user experience. It's also our ability to get access to the data we want. So if you look at the picture, this is truly what we want. There are no lightning bolts here. And this is real, this is possible today. And this is the vision of what we want. We want to build a fabric that is so massive, that is so difficult for our adversary to degrade. And we want a fabric that we can freely maneuver through it. We can deny adversary freedom of action. We can retain freedom of maneuver for our forces in cyberspace. And imagine if you had airplanes, drones, and satellites all connected together, um, creating this mass so that even in D-deal environments, you can have almost assured communications. I say almost because you can never have assured, right? But with the technology that we're proposing, we can have almost assured communications. All right, and so um, the last bullet here is to sim simply um, denote that this is a cyberspace environment and there are new TTPs that we can develop that we've not thought about yet. Remember when Al Gore invented the internet back in 1995? <laughs> and um, he didn't invent Netflix, he didn't invent Amazon, he didn't invent Facebook. He invented SMTP, TCP IP, DNS, uh, ICMP. And it was later through the innovation of the people with self-interest that developed these new technologies that we are enjoying today. But it took innovation. And what we want to do is build a framework, a foundational framework, on which we can innovate. We have a bright, uh, vibrant private sector. Let's exploit that. We have the Amazons, AWSs, we have Microsofts, we got Oracles, we got Starlink, we got Kuiper, we got OneWeb, we got AT&T, we got Verizon. Let's leverage that and go to war with a whole of nation approach instead of whole of DOD or whole of Army or whole of DOD and DISA. Uh, but we want them to take all of us down if they want to degrade us. That's the only way we're gonna be able to win, is if we come together. Last week, in DC area, uh, we had something that uh, was like crossing the streams in the world, as we knew it almost ended. Uh, last week, AWS and Microsoft got in the same room, <laughs> and they were talking about how to develop and share a booth in the future. I challenged them uh, at, uh, in Colorado. For a next conference like this in August at FIDIC, I challenge you guys to share a booth and show how you guys can interoperate in a true multi-cloud environment. And you know what? They did that last week. And I would love to see more folks do that so that when you come to a conference like this, we're not committing fratricide on each other, but we're collaborating so that we're building the best, we're leveraging the best from our industry so that we can go to war with the whole nation approach. Anyway, uh, moving on. But obviously that includes not only terrestrial networks and LTE and all, but also terrestrial and space and aerial networks. We want a fabric that is so robust, that is so assured, that is almost impossible to take down. So imagine if you have Starlink, if you got Kuiper, if you got LTE, if you got um, uh, 
military SATCOM, WGS, which is what we deploy with today, only with today. What if we had these modalities of communications to our warfighters who are deploying? Think about what they can do. So today, that's exactly what the, this is, I'll let you read that on your own when you get the slides, but um, I'm going to blow through these slides. But this slide basically demonstrates the end goal for the warfighters on the left, or operators on the left, or people sitting at desks on the left, is to get to what's on the right, which is data. They need to get data to the users, and they need to go through a bunch of different devices and services in the middle in order to do that. And we want to create an approach based on persona. So if you're a tactical warfighter, the tools that you use from each of these boxes may be different. If you're sitting behind a desk in the Pentagon, the tools that you need are different, but they provide services, they have compute and store capability, you still need a network, you still need connectivity, all that's required, but the form factor for each may be different, right? So this is what we're trying to get to, to ease that. Today when we deploy uh, in um, operations, what do we do? We, use, we have to go through DISA and we have to uh, submit a GAR, SAR request in order to use MILSAT. WGS, and the bandwidth is really good, right? Like four megs, really cool, really fast. Um, and it's also really high up, so it's hard to attack, right? No, the Chinese know exactly where the geosynchronous satellites are, and they're limited in their footprint, and we're all congested. So are we survivable? I don't know. Do we really think that when the first bullet flies that we're gonna have continual co communications for warfighters to be able to generate aircraft, to be able to hop, from island to island in the Pacific? I don't know, but we want to give them as much um, opportunity, as great a chance to uh, succeed and survive as possible. And so that's what we're doing um, with, with IWN. It's really IWN is not, it's an underlying protocol that we're using. Um, uh, what we do then is we, we pull in for, for this first tranche of delivery into the uh, war fighting, war fighters in the Pacific. And because of, the, uh, because of the partnership we have with PACAF, and uh, we see one of the, the robots sitting right there, he's one of the key planners uh, that we've been partnered with. What we're doing is delivering initially a shim, if you will, that pulls in multiple modalities of communications. So Starlink, um, bundled LTE, and uh, also a local provider. So that when we fail over, when we ex have to execute pace plan, we're not doing it cognitively, but we're doing it automatically with automation. So you're not thinking about where's my connectivity coming from. You're simply consuming the connectivity without thinking about it. It's like electricity. It's just there. And then when you have one fail from one to the other, uh, in traditional networking, uh, like TCP, when it fails, uh, it really is up to the application to recover and reestablish three-way handshake. But because these routers are now stateful, what we've seen is we lose one packet from failover to be able to sustain that. So imagine if our warfighters who are on the ground need to hop from island to island to island and still maintain this assured connectivity. And that's what this is. Um, should advance this. And, and so this, this is the first step to this UBF that I described earlier. UBF ubiquitous uh, connectivity, because we know that our first conflict is going to probably arise in the Pacific somewhere. If you look on the islands, you can see on Google map where the islands that China have uh, fortified are. It's no secret. Everyone knows where they are. And, and so are they going to extend their reach out beyond their shores into our interests? If you're a guessing man, you know, prob or a woman, uh, you probably say yes. And I tell people that my job here is to prevent you from having to learn Mandarin. Or, if you want to learn Mandarin, I can help you with that too. <laughs> so, really, what we, um, uh, what we are doing here is this, and I want to focus most of my time on here. How much time do I have left? 15 minutes, okay, good. Um, <clears throat> these are some of the key capabilities that we're looking for in IWN. And um, remember I told you how we have Microsoft and Amazon sit in the same room. I would love to see Cisco and Juniper sit in the same room. 
and start talking about what they can do together in order to build these capabilities for our warfighters. And instead of committing fratricide, let's collaborate. Let's build what is right for our nation so that we can re preserve this republic, right? So the first thing that we want to do is make sure that we're using a software-defined approach, this is what, which is what this is. So it has to be able to instantiate on NAX86 uh, commodity hardware, which is what we're doing. Um, we got to have, we got to get rid of tunnels. Tunnels constrict us and they re, uh, restrict us. So by getting rid of tunnels, we can do full end-to-end -end encryption without IPsec, without tunnels. And tunnels take up space, right? So for small packets, you have the inefficiency of the packet headers. And what it does is um, it gives us a ability to maneuver. So today, when you have a tunnel from point A to point B, 100% of your traffic go through the tunnel. So if you have higher latency or jitter, then you can't break out of the tunnel to maneuver. But now, with what we're doing without the tunnels, we can now uh, achieve tunnelless tunnels, if that makes any sense. So now you can move about. So for example, if you experience latency and you have a voice path, uh, voice traffic taking place, you want to be able to revector the traffic. You can now do that and vector just a piece of it, the voice piece. But you get a file share backup that you need a lot of bandwidth. You don't care about latency and jitter. You can simply use the best path. So now you can split up your tunnels into multiple tunnels tunnels. Gives you freedom of maneuver that we didn't have before. Now we do. And it's all organic to the routers themselves. Um, that allows me to vector, right? So if you decide, hey, I don't trust Batman. I think his PC is compromised for whatever reason. Hey, let's revector it into a honeypot or maybe to the special uh, sauce package that NSA has and capture some packets there. I can now say, without him knowing about it, without interrupting session, be able to revector the traffic and be able to capture packets as I need to and be able to automate that. And the resilient failure I described already, having only one packet drop between link to link. Now, is that possible today? Yeah, it is possible. But how many CCIs would you need uh, to do that, to make that work, to tweak those timers, right, uh, on, uh, on the fast convergent protocols? And, and there are those, you can, you can do that with existing protocols. And uh, I say, the next piece, number five, assured messaging. Imagine if you've got five links that your warfighters have uh, through Starlink, WGS, bundled LTE, and you get a message. You want to transmit a SIT rep, and this is critical. So you can now mark special types of traffic as no fail, assured messaging. And what the routers will do now is replicate the packets 100% down every path. Well, any specialized software. It's just native. Mark it, sent. And whatever link, if you just have one link up, your message will get across. And we need that for our warfighters. We need to be able to maneuver, right? Uh, extensibility. Um, most of you guys probably have served in one uh, form or another in the military, probably in cyber operations. And you are uh, familiar with <clears throat> information conditions, uh, cyber protection conditions, and when those things change, we have TROs and TPOs that change also. And today, how do TPOs and TROs get implemented? Airmen, fat fingering commands on keyboards. I submit to you, that we need to automate all that. We need to take the man out of the loop. We can be on the loop, we can change things, we can affect things, but we need to be able to automate everything that we do. We don't need to be, um, when I talked to um, 624th before they converted to 616, I asked, I asked them how they do their um, TROs and TPOs, and they gave me sc scary stories of, of, well, it usually takes days, sometimes weeks, to make it happen, right? Imagine we do this now, we can automate it. Infocon changes, TPOs get executed right away because we're now extending the fabric into our weapon systems, right? Um, and we can now make uh, traffic routing discriminations based on the tra traffic type. Ah, I know this is uh, VTC. It requires low jitter, and anybody can do this. DPAC inspection, we can mark headers, we can mark DSCP code points and all. Uh, so that's not that special, but we need that for our warfighters, right? That kind of quality of service. Um, the, um, and we also uh, can also now enable multicast 
joins and leaves over foreign networks. When I mean foreign networks, I mean networks you have no control over, like in China. You can multicast from China to the US. How about that? Um, now you can do that with traditional uh, tunneling protocols as well. That's possible, but this is all native. And I want to emphasize, we don't have to do special sauce to make this happen. This just works. Uh, the next piece is um, L3 over L, uh, L2 over L3. And number 11 is the most interesting piece, and it's not rocket science. So the way that we're able to maneuver, uh, if you ask a question, because uh, when I first got exposed to this, I thought, well, how do you maneuver? Well, what they're doing is doing source and destination natting. So if you were to intercept man in the middle, any packet, you can only see where the last top it was, it came from, and the next top it's going. You can never discern the origin of the packet or the session or the ultimate destination. Like IBSEC you can because you have the headers inside, right? And the way that you do this is they package all the metadata, all the header type information into a small package called metadata. And they include this metadata <clears throat> into the first packet of every session that is being established. And once passes down from point A to point Z, that metadata is extracted by every hop along the way and put into memory. And all the subsequent packets don't have this metadata, only the session numbers and the sequence numbers, such that the routers will recognize what session that belongs to and can treat it appropriately and vector it appropriately. And so you can never compromise. Your chances of getting compromised uh, are much lower because you don't have metadata anymore. And our adversaries won't be able to discern uh, where the destination and origin are. Make sense? So anyway, um, in the end, the integrated warfighting network looks like a stack. And this is my rendition of the stack. At the bottom layer, we have multiple modalities of transport. Uh, LTE, 5G, free space optics, which is probably one thing that we'll have to test next, um, to be able to go from distant islands to distant islands over free, with uh, free space optics to see what, we can, what kind of bandwidth we can get. And what we do is we bundle, we pull all these together into what I call the UBF, ubiquitous black fabric. And on that layer, we would want to create a data fabric, right? Um, using something like Kafka-based data fabric so that we can share information very freely that way. So imagine if I've got a data river flowing through space and I want to consume a piece of data, I simply reach up and grab it, do what I do with it, do some inferencing, and then push the results back into a data river. And anybody can subscribe to the topic. And that's what I want to do. And on top of that layer is where you see the weapon systems. F-15s, 35s, satellites, AOCs, um, AWACS, they all then consume from the data fabric, all the data they need. And they publish the data that they have into the same data fabric for others to consume. But that data fabric cannot exist without well, the underlying network, all the plumbing that connects everything together. And that's critical for us to achieve that. So anyway, I, I blew through this very quickly without any questions. So uh, I think we have a few minutes and I'll stay here longer uh, for any questions. But this, this should get you guys a vision of what we mean by the IWN. It's not a thing, you can't buy it, but it's an architectural framework. It's applying a growth mindset to, to, to think about how we solve this problem for our warfighters. Make sense? Questions? And there are microphones where you can yell it, I don't care. I'll be here. No questions? You got a question, Charlie, come on. <laughs> yes, sir. K A C. Mm -hmm. I think they're great. Let's use them all. Let's use them all. We got to use them all. We have them. Let's use them. And uh, I've been talking to. Um, I can't say the name yet, but but we're talking to um, uh, vendors who are making um, special lens antennas that can talk multiple bands. So instead of having, you know bunch of antennas sticking up on the top of the air airplane and on the bottom of the airplane, you have one antenna on top or on bottom, right? Sheila? So if you're building out the architecture through CAO, when you move to actual implementation and rolling out a, a solution, who's going to be doing the acquisition and who's driving the 
So we are, uh, we're partnering with our uh, C-Match comms, uh, the Combatant Command Match comms, and like, you know, PACAF and your safety, and um, they inform, and ACC, and they inform the acquisitions arm of what the requirements ought to be. And then they go out and do the procurement because we need the long tail. We were not, the CAO's office is not in the business of procurement. Uh, we're in the business of architecture. And so what we're trying to do is come up with an architecture that can be sustaining. And so the, um, the uh, protocol that um, we are using to make this happen is called Secure Vector Routing. It was created by a company called 128 Technology that was bought by Juniper about a year and a half, two years ago. And uh, when I got first exposed to them, I, um, I had conversations with their founder and I said, you know what? And it took me about three months to get it. But when I got it, I was like, holy smokes, this render my CCIE totally invalid now. The way I think about networking no longer applies because this is really an overlay, right? And, um, and I told a C, uh, one of the founders, I think this is cool, but this is gonna be open. Otherwise, DOD can't use it. And um, so last October, it got released to, uh, uh, to the IETF as an information uh, um, RFC. And then a couple weeks ago, it got rolled from information RFC to a protection RFC. Um, and what I was told was, if that can't be uh, adopted fast enough uh, by IETF, then they will independently release it to the world. So, so the interest is there, and so um, the link is also there on the interwebs that you can download uh, all the uh, standards. Michael. How do we make it joint? How do we make it joint? And that's one of the reasons why I asked um, uh, Jeff to allow me to speak here is to really tell all of y'all what we're doing in the Air Force, and so we can start having conversations about how we make this interoperable. Uh, because what I told the team was, if we do this well for the Air Force, we will have built something that's really awesome in a silo. But unless we go joint, we won't, we won't have anything great. But in order for us to fight China well, we have to do this with a whole nation approach. And so that's why I'm here trying to really just share what we're, what we're doing. And we're still in very early stages. So we're not locked in 100% to Juniper, uh, to SVR, if there's something better that comes along that can give us all the requirements we, ha we have, all the needs that we, the warfighters need, we'll pivot. Um, but we want to make this a whole of nation approach. We want to take the best from private sector uh, to, to achieve the greatest uh, for our warfighters. That, and to a chance to continue to speak English so my English can improve also. Um, <laughs> Bingo, yeah. You're, gonna go into yeah. You're not going in alone. Every That's right. That's right. You've got to think That's right. not just cross service, which was discussed in the J6 panel, but you've got to think MPE. That's right. MPE. Mm -hmm. the Correct. One of the questions we had a conference call this morning with 16 the Air Force, and their concern was how is this going to impact the existing network now? Because it's, you know, as you know, it's, there's a lot of tech debt, right? And uh, Butch was asking those questions. and. And, um, well, the nice thing is, because it's a standard router uh, with SVR on top of it, we can do backwards interoperability with, you know, OSP, FB, GP, and whatnot. So that, that shouldn't be a problem. And so the approach is to want to do it in parallel first. We don't want to break anything. Do no harm, right? Um, but once, once we pull it out, we want to be able to roll it out more broadly to the enterprise. Um, it's going to take some time. Um, we're, we're really focused on the wide area network to connect bases. Okay. Um, and the base level, um, that may look different. I'm not sure how yet. So, yeah. Sir. Sure. Yeah, as you know, with like CSOT, it's kind of the standard to be able to use commercial products to do something like that. With right. Data. Um, with, with going to uh, secure vector routing, you're potentially changing that Early on when, when I helped set the standard for that, there was a lot of arguments between, hey, if you do two IPsec tunnels, you have a lot of overhead costs in it. And that was a flaw that we never fully remedied. And, and you introduced there some very fine points of some of the flaws in there. Are you going to try to like get that adapted in the CSOT, or are you going to do it as a, as a, a separate solution? 
That's a great question, and I promise you I did not plant that, but I'll buy you a drink later. Um, you know, I talked about effective mass, right? The concept of mass for our warfighter is important, and the concept of maneuver is just as important. So right now, CSFC is awesome because a, a commercial solution for classified CSFC um, today uses usually two tunnels, inner tunnel and outside tunnel, usually VPN. And uh, the thinking that we, we've been talking about was if we replaced the outer tunnel possibly with SVR, we will have gained maneuverability uh, using CFCC. Uh, so yes, we've been thinking about it and we need partners to come alongside us to help us think about these uh, difficult problems. Yeah. Right, um, yeah, so this is uh, Donald um, Carter, by the way, uh, formerly NSA, and also uh, one of the um, found, uh, fathers, um, godfathers of the CSFC uh, standard. So um, thank you for that. Any, yeah. any, anybody else? We're gonna, we're gonna have to pull the plug. Say again? Yeah, we're gonna, and oh, yeah. I wanna say mahalo, Colonel, for one, taking the time to come to Hawaii and um, again, allowing me to drag you over here. I think it was a tough, uh, ask for me to get you to come to Hawaii from <laughs> Seattle, but I appreciate you taking the time and the effort and coming out and I know we'll talk again on some of these things and also I wanted to say mahalo uh, for all of our speakers. We are get, making a donation uh, to the Friends of the Windward Wounded Warriors on your behalf, so thank you very much, Colonel. I have already given you a thank challenge you. coin, so thank you again. Uh, as you know, in 15 minutes we have our keynote from Indopaycom. It'll be the Chief of Staff across the way in the top of tower. So again, thanks to everybody. And Colonel's gonna stick around a bit, as he said, to answer questions. This is more sorry for that we had a short time, but trying to make sure we got you fit in. Right. So again, mahalo everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. <laughs>